Hey guys, Ranger Jesse Jewell here at Henry Horton State Park. So today we're down here at the Duck River and I wanted to talk to y'all a minute about river safety and how you can, on your next trip, be safer and have more fun with your family and friends. So hang around for that. All right, like I said in the intro, we're gonna be talking about river safety. So one thing I do whenever I go to the river is I kind of follow a five tip process. These uh, by no means are end all be all and you should research it for yourself as well and gain more knowledge as you go along. But these will be five tips that can kind of help you as you go to the river next time. So the most important part to me is the number one tip that we're gonna go over today is planning and preparation. A lot of that is researching there before you go, checking weather patterns, uh, knowing the water, uh, water levels. All this can be found out usually online, but uh, you can also access the knowledge of locals, such as park rangers in the area, um, commercial outfitters if there's kayaking uh, on that section. So definitely utilizing those people, look them up, find them. But a lot of times when you have kind of figured out the section of river you wanted to come to, whether that is swimming or kayaking, you can a lot of times find these kiosks right at the river access. So here at the park at Henry Horton, we have this one that uh, kind of gives you a better idea of what you're looking at and kind of some information on the ecology and stuff of the water so you can better enjoy your time while you're here. Uh, a lot of times they will have maps on here and you can access these maps too online. A lot of times TWRA in the state of Tennessee or whatever your wildlife management uh, is for your state. So just accessing those resources can help you plan for your next trip. And then we also, in that planning stage, you wanna look at your gear, kind of boats, everything you're gonna take with you. All right, so like I said, we're gonna go over five tips that I use whenever I plan my trips. This is gonna be number two, and it's gonna be the gear that you're gonna take with you. We kind of discussed it in number one, but I thought it deserved its own uh, section. So the first things we're gonna talk about is, let's say you're coming to the river and you wanna do a kayaking trip with your family. Here in the Duck River, it's relatively calm water, class one, flat water. So picking the right boat can make your experience much more enjoyable and safer. So we have two boats in front of me right here. We have a Jackson Riviera and a Jackson All-Star. Uh, these are both great boats, um, made by the same company, a lot of the same materials, but the only difference is one's made for whitewater and play boating or getting actually in, enjoying the whitewater a different way. This is designed to track better in the water, so keep going straight down the river on flat sections of water. The way the boats are designed, uh, the holes are designed differently to do different things. So understanding how boats work can help you and your family and friends enjoy the river more. So just be aware of that when you do decide to come to the river, look at local outfitters and see what they're using. Everybody on the Duck River here, including the state parks, a lot of us use these Jackson Rivieras. They're sit on top boats. They're very easy to control, very easy for beginners uh, to experience kayakers to control. So definitely love finding something that works for you will help out in the future. So continuing on discussing gear, we've talked about the boats. I'm gonna move on to footwear. This is probably another very important uh, aspect of playing in the river. Whether you are swimming or on a boat, having the proper footwear will change the whole day and <clears throat> how things go. So what I have in front of me, I have three different types of shoes. Uh, these are Astrals. They are water shoes designed. They look like tennis shoes, but they have very good grip on the bottom. They are sturdy, so when you're walking across rocks and in the water, you don't kind of feel unstable. So it keeps you from uh, moving around a lot in the water or move, things moving under you, you're able to keep your footing a lot better. Same thing, I'm not as crazy about open-toed shoes like Chacos, but this company designs them very well and they're very sturdy. So if you do decide to wear some sort of sandal, making sure that sole is very um, rigid 
will help out a lot too. And then just regular water shoes, kind of like booties, anything like that, you can get at Walmart. Even though those aren't necessarily the best in the world, they will kind of protect your feet and keep you from cutting them on things in the river or uh, just giving you a little extra protection. One thing I do want to discuss when it comes to footwear is things that we probably all wear when we go down the river but may not necessarily uh, be the best thing for you and those are Crocs. I love them, I have a pair, they're great, but if you look over time, they start wearing off. So if you try to walk down even our boat ramp here, you're probably gonna fall and end up injuring yourself and they just don't stay on your feet very much. You, you've probably noticed it when you've gone out with your friends and family on the water and people lose their sandals if they're wearing flip-flops, things like that. So making sure you have the right footwear that's gonna stay on your feet will help out, kind of keep things safer. The next step in planning your gear is what kind of clothes you're gonna wear when you come to the river. Uh, a lot of times you're just gonna wear a bathing suit and a cotton t-shirt. And that may be okay for if you're just going down to play in the water and it's a nice summer hot day. But if you decide to maybe get on a boat in October when the weather is not so desirable, maybe a rainy day, you may start out, it may have started out sunny, but now the clouds have rolled in and it's raining. Having certain gear with you can kind of help you be more comfortable and be safer so that you don't have issues with hypothermia or uh, just having that uncomfortable wanting to get out of the situation. So in front of me, I have a couple of different materials. Uh, things that are good for water, neoprene, polyester, these are things that will wick water away from your body and keep you warmer longer. Uh, we also have a couple of dry suits and dry tops. Um, this right here is a splash jacket, so it's not gonna necessarily keep you completely dry, but it's gonna repel some of that water. So as you're splashing around and getting wet, even by the rain, that's not gonna sit on your skin and just kind of fest around and make it uncomfortable. The neoprene, they make them in different sizes, different layers, so that you can find what's comfortable for you in keeping your body warm while out on the water. So when you do plan your next trip, Go to the store, go to you know Walmart sells stuff that uh, can work better than cotton. So definitely check that out. And then uh, next we'll go into uh, some other gear that we're gonna take along the way. All right, so the third tip we're gonna talk about is PFDs, life jackets, or personal flotation devices. So as you can tell, I'm wearing one right now. We're down by the river. So what we're gonna do in this section is we're gonna talk about a couple of different types and how to figure out what you need for the sport or for the recreational activity you're participating in. So whenever you think about wearing a life jacket, uh, there's a couple of things you wanna consider. You wanna get something that's comfortable that you're going to wear. Uh, a lot of times we see issues with people like, oh, we left it in the truck or we left it in the boat because it just wasn't comfortable to wear, it's hot. Uh, they make tons of designs of, car, of life jackets that will fit your needs and fit what you want in a life jacket. Uh, best place to figure out what you need is either going to TWRE in the state of Tennessee. They have great resources on life jackets and the laws uh, pertaining to life jacket wearing in the state of Tennessee. You also want to go to the U.S. Coast Guard. They're the ones who actually test life jackets and they kind of rate it for us to show what we need in certain situations. Uh, here on the Duck River, we're going to mostly wear Type 3 life jackets. I'm currently wearing a Type 5, which is a special or a rescue life jacket. Uh, that class five classification also goes for your inflatable. So a lot of times you'll see bass fishermen that wear the little inflatable life jackets because they don't necessarily need a big bulky life jacket while they're casting or on the deck of the boat, but they do want something. So in case of emergency, they fall out of the water, something they have on that's going to protect them. As you can see down here, we have a few different life jackets. Some are the ones we use here at the state and then others were just personal life jackets. So this first one is made by a company called NRS. Um, you can tell inside of it what uh, it's good for, what it's rated for. Each life jacket's gonna have a diagram on it or kind of like a placard. It's gonna say it's rated by the US Coast Guard. This is a type three life jacket. It's made for an adult. Uh, it is an extra large. So it says the weight range on here is more than 90 pounds. So this would not be good for a young child who uh, is, even though it looks like a smaller life jacket, it's not where the buoyancy isn't there for them. So being aware of that, uh, we have a child's one next to it. This one's going to have the same, same, same kind of diagram, but it's gonna say it's a youth life jacket, and it's gonna show you the weight range for um, a young child. So this one goes up to 50 to 90 pounds. So this one would be right under that uh, extra large adult one. 
So knowing the different types of life jackets and knowing what they're rated for will definitely help out. Like I said, the best resource for that is US Coast Guard or TWRA in the state of Tennessee. So the reason I separate PFDs from the rest of my gear when it comes to my five tips that I go with is because it is so important. Here in Tennessee, we see a lot of accidents happen on the river and on lakes just because people weren't wearing life jackets. It can not only save your life, but it can save other people's life. So if you go into the water and you're not wearing a life jacket and something that happens to you, chances are there's gonna be somebody close by, family member, friend, who's gonna come in there after you and it could potentially be uh, deadly for both of you. So try and even if you don't wanna wear it for yourself, wear it for others and just keep our, our waters here in Tennessee safe. All right, so we've talked about planning and prepping the trip. We've talked about the gear that you're gonna take and wearing a life jacket while you're at the river. The fourth tip we're gonna talk about is letting somebody know where you're going and taking somebody with you. You never wanna boat alone and you never wanna go somewhere without somebody knowing where you are. Whenever you plan your trip, you figured out where you're gonna go. Let's say you're coming here to the Duck River. You're gonna put in uh, upstream from here and you're gonna take out at Henry Horton. Uh, letting somebody know what put in you're putting in it and where you're taking out and how long you expect to be on the water will make you safer and so in case something does happen or let's say weather moves in and you have to kind of sit on the bank for a few more hours than you're expecting somebody's somebody's expecting to look for you and if you don't show up when you told them you're going to then they're going to start kind of calling people and kind of figuring out where you are so it will help if something does happen to you to get in, uh, to get rescuers to you faster Secondly, the reason you want to take somebody with you on the water is let's say that you go somewhere you're not very familiar with. Maybe you're scouting some new waterways. Having somebody with you, it kind of makes it to where if something does happen, let's say, you know, your boat flips over. You're not trying to deal with that issue alone. And somebody's with you who can kind of help manage your gear and other people. A lot of the times, usually a good rule of thumb is taking at least three people with you. That way in an emergency, somebody can stay with one person and somebody can go get help. So you're not leaving an injured person or the situation back. You have somebody there who can manage it properly. So being aware of that, if you can have three people with you, that's just gonna make for a safer time on the water. The fifth and final tip we're gonna talk about today is knowing your limits. So no matter what kind of water sport you're gonna participate in on the river, whether it's paddle boarding, whitewater rafting, kayaking, flatwater kayaking, knowing your limits as a person is going to keep you safe next time you go on a trip. So if you have no experience in whitewater, look at going with a company or going with somebody who can kind of teach you some of the uh, skills and things that you need so that you can develop over time and have a better experience and if that is something that you want to pursue. But kind of looking at your own skill level and what you're looking to do and not getting it over your head is going to keep you safe and everybody else around you safe. Now that we've talked about the five tips, I want to show you a couple of things to be aware of next time you're on the water. Things to look out for and just kind of keep in the back of your head so that you can kind of pick out some things and stay safer when actually on the water. Today's a great uh, example of that. The water's a little high, we've had a lot of rain. So we'll be able to look at a couple of these um, hazards, if you will, and talk about them and explain what you can do to avoid them. So the first hazard we're going to talk about is strainers. A lot of times when you're on the river, you'll see trees that have fallen into the water. That's going to be your number one strainer that we'll see. A lot of times it can be man-made too. What happens is water will flow around, over, under these structures, such as a tree behind me, if you can see in the distance. It's fallen off the bank, and what's happening is the current is pushing over it. Well, if your boat or your body, if you're swimming, gets pushed up against that, all the force of the water that's pushing against there will not allow you to uh, get off of it. So unless somebody's there with you and has either a throw up or some sort of extrication uh, devices, it's going to be very hard to get you off of that. So looking at those uh, hazards and knowing that they're there and trying to stay away from them as you're navigating the water will help just you know protect you and your group uh, from those hazards. The next hazard we're going to talk about is undercut rocks or places where water has eroded some of the rock underneath the, the exposed rock and you can't really see it. So what I have behind me is an example. These aren't covered up, so they don't pose a hazard right now. But if you happen to be on the Duck River when the water's a little bit higher, some of these little pockets 
can uh, become into play. So what an undercut rock is, a lot of the times it's where water has eroded underneath the rocks, or like you see behind me where rocks have kind of stacked up and they create little pockets underneath them that a lot of times water can flow through, but uh, debris, uh, man-made stuff, trash, and kayaks can get stuck in them. So as you're paddling along, you may not see these hazards, but they're underneath the surface. These aren't things to be afraid of, they're things to be aware of. These are all manageable risk uh, when kayaking or playing on the water, just being aware where these are. A lot of times you'll see people, we see it all the time out here, they'll come jump off the bluffs and they don't really realize that there is a lot of current still pushing through that area and you know, you can get pulled underneath those shelves and in itself may not be dangerous, but when you get hung up in that debris and everything that comes with it, it can pose a, a dangerous situation. So another hazard to be aware of, one on the river. The final hazard we're gonna talk about is gonna be low head dams. These are probably some of the most underrated hazards that we have on a lot of our waterways here in Tennessee, but a lot of times they pose the most danger. So if you look behind me, the water's up a little bit here on the Duck River. We're down at uh, Milltown Dam. And uh, as you can see, as the water goes over it, what happens is it creates what's called a hydraulic at the bottom of the falls. If you see, the water's kind of recirculating on itself, kind of like if you watch the washing machine go back and forth. And what happens is if you're kayaking along this section or even swimming above the dam, uh, if you happen to end up over it, a lot of times that recirculation will keep your body and your boat inside there and won't let you out and can potentially turn into a drowning situation. So being aware of where these are, we're about six miles south of the park right now. A lot of times we'll have people put on at the park and they don't really know what's down below. They just kind of start going and uh, we have to inform them that hazards like this are along the way. So definitely looking at maps and knowing your way before you go can uh, mitigate some of these uh, potential risk factors. So definitely a big hazard to look out for and just be aware of them as you're going down the river next time.